I am so happy to be here today. I'm so happy to be here with all of you today. Because our being here today matters. Coming together today matters. It matters because having more women in the workforce, having more senior women in senior positions matters. It matters because diverse leadership teams lead to better company results. They lead to, are you ready for this? Higher returns, lower risk, lower volatility, greater customer focus, greater long-term focus, greater innovation, better stockholder returns, lower gender pay disparity. Nothing bad happens, only good things happen when we have more diverse leadership teams. And the power of diversity is so great that diverse leadership teams actually outperform more capable leadership teams. So all of that leads to a better economy. But even with all that good news, I'm probably not surprising this group when I tell you that progress on diversity in corporate America has stalled. And in my industry, Wall Street, we've actually gone backwards on diversity. So here we had an industry which going into the downturn was white, male, and middle-aged, and we came out whiter, maler, and middle-ageder. <laughs> we essentially doubled down as a country on that bet. And I think we could all probably agree that if there is an industry that could use lower risk, more customer focus, more long-term focus, it's Wall Street. Now, I'll acknowledge that if changing the, the numbers on diversity were easy, it would be easy. If there were an answer, there'd be one answer. And we can actually spend the rest of today, this weekend, and into next week discussing the challenges. And in fact, I'm sure some of you think, as we start to discuss them, I'm going to start to discuss overt discrimination. But I'm not. Some of you may think we're going to talk about maybe the more difficult, subtle discrimination, but I'm not. Some of you may think I'm going to talk about the greater housework and childcare we women do, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about something that's actually important, but that's received very little attention, hair and makeup. <laughs> I'm actually serious. And this came to me some years ago when I was on a trip to Brazil with, you know, 10 guys, all of whom were junior to me. We'd been out to about 1 o'clock the night before with clients. We were down to catch the plane the next day, 6 a.m. The guys came down and said, oh my gosh, I've been, I just rolled out of bed, been up for 10 minutes. I said, I've been up for one hour putting this together. <laughs> Even if you only take 15 minutes to put on your hair and makeup, 15 minutes a day, an hour and 15 minutes a week, six, six hours a, year, a month, 60 hours a year, 60 hours a year, 15 minutes a week, hair and makeup. No wonder we're tired. <laughs> but the point is, we do have expectations of ourselves and society has them of ourselves, which actually makes it exhausting for us. And so we have the opportunity today to come together and listen to some amazing, amazingly successful women who will talk about what they thought was important, what they let slip, what they put away, so that they could be wildly successful. And we have the opportunity to learn from their success. But I'm today going to talk about something different. I'm not going to talk about my successes. Now, as you heard in my introduction, I, I did okay. You know, I was the CEO of Smith Barney. I was brought in to turn it around with my team after the research scandal. I was the CEO of Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. I was brought in to turn it around with my team after the subprime scandal. I was a woman in a mostly male world. And not too surprisingly, I was typically on the cleanup crew. But instead of talking you through that, I'm actually going to talk you through my failures because Jacqueline was too nice in her kind introduction to let you know that I've actually been fired twice. And it's been on the front page of the Wall Street Journal 
twice. <laughs> and I want to tell you what I learned during my failures. But first, a bit of my story. It's 2008. I'm the CEO of Smith Barney. The markets are crashing. We sold products to individual investors, which we truly believed were low risk, but they weren't. We truly believed that they would go down about eight cents on the dollar in a bad market. We had a bad market. They went down about 100 cents on the dollar. Now, I'll tell you, I looked and looked and looked and looked, and for the life of me, never could find anything illegal or immoral about what the team had done. No, 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 we had lost money for our clients the old-fashioned way. We were stupid. <laughs> the big print said the products were low risk. The little print said clients could lose everything. So I went to the CEO and advocated the CEO for sharing part of the pain of those losses with the clients. My CEO disagreed. So I said yes, he said no. I said yes, he said no. I said yes, he said no. I said yes, he stopped returning my phone calls. I said yes, he stopped taking meetings with me. I said yes, he stopped looking at me in group meetings. The board found out about the debate and asked us to come in and talk to him about it. I said yes, he said no. The board said yes, I lost my job. My Bank of America story is a bit less dramatic. I was between jobs after my city firing. One morning I got a call from the CEO of Bank of America who said, come on in. We need, your, we need you and your team to turn around Merrill Lynch. It's been dramatically shrinking since we bought it. He said he'd stay for two years to ensure my, my transition. He announced his retirement less than two months later. I offered to resign to the new CEO. He said, no, 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 stay, stay. Two years later, as the turnaround was complete, he came in, thanked me for my service, reorganized the management, and sent me home. So what did I learn? Oh, I learned a lot of things. I'm not going to share all of them here with you today, but I have five lessons I want to share with you. Number one, if it comes down to your ethics versus a job, you can always find another job. People ask me when ethics can be so gray, when this is a... Oh. Ethics are gray. Ethics are not black and white. And this is OK, but half a degree over here is not OK. How do you know? My answer, my stomach. If I can't eat, something's wrong. Sometimes, though, my stomach fails me. And when my stomach fails me and I'm asking that question, I'm asking myself what's right, right what's wrong, I actually have an exercise I go through, which I actually ask my ideal self. I ask the person I want to be what she would do, and that to me is a very simple exercise that gets me to the right answer almost every time. Second, a sponsor matters. I didn't say a mentor. Mentors are great. Mentors answer questions. Mentors give you advice. A sponsor is a super mentor who's willing to fight for you, to fight for you for the job, for the raise, for the promotion, for the board seat, for the new project, for you not to be fired. We women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. Over the course of my career, I've had sponsors and I've not had sponsors. And let me tell you, if you're leaning in, when you've got a sponsor, somebody's got you by the ankles. If you don't, sometimes you fall flat on your face. Three, your network matters. And the research shows that we ladies don't have nearly the network of the gentlemen. And that's one of the reasons, when you put aside the, the people leaving the workforce to raise children, et cetera, it is one of the primary reasons that the gentlemen begin to pull ahead of us in their 30s and get those promotions. It's not ability. It's not hard work. It's their network. Networking has been called the number one unwritten rule of success in business. And did you know that your next business opportunity is more likely to come from a loose connection from somebody that you meet here than it is from a close colleague or a friend? I used to think it was because my loose connections didn't know me as well as my close colleagues or friends. 
But it's actually that when you're planting those little seeds, lots of little seeds, that it can be the difference between hearing about a new business opportunity, a research breakthrough in your field, a board opportunity, a new job, a startup that's threatening your space, the difference between hearing about it and not. Because you and your friends and your close colleagues, you're all trafficking in the same information. It's by spreading out the people you know that instead can bring you new information. And that's in part why what we're doing here today matters. And in part, you know, even though I don't love this research, the research shows we're more comfortable networking with our own gender. And that's why I recently bought and invested in the amusingly named 85 Broads, which, thank you, I like her, which is a professional women's network, 32,000 strong, across industries and across the world. Appropriately enough, I came to 85 Broads through my network. I happened to sit next to Arthur Levitt, the former chair of the SEC on an airplane. I said, you're Arthur Levitt. He said, you are? Sally Krawcheck, I said. He introduced me to Steve Feldman, who introduced me to Savneet Singh, who introduced me to Nick Baum. You get the point. Nine people later, I came across 85 Broads. But what particularly compelled me is that when we found that our members who have the benefits of networking and professional education were more likely to stay in their industries and in their jobs, therefore being more successful than those who were not part of the network. It's power that I saw in my own career. Number four, the companies that I see winning are those who are truly embracing diversity, not just to have it in their value statement and their mission statement, not who just say they embrace diversity, not the ones who try to coach us to be like men, how to ask for raises the way men do, but who truly allow us to bring our deep relationship focus, our deep client focus to the table, and who really hear us and embrace our views. They don't do lip service to flexibility, but really embrace flexibility without shame. They're the ones who don't silently punish the people who take flexible time. And for that, they get the benefit of our diverse perspective, our hard work, and they get our loyalty. Number five, lesson. And my most important lesson from what I've been through, which is the answer to the question we all get, we all get it. How do you do it? And I, in particular, get the, how do you get back up after you've been knocked down? Someone once called me a weeble. Anybody remember the weebles? You got it, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down, they pop back up. We said, how are you a weeble? And the answer for me is the power of gratitude. I don't want to take anything away from all the hard work I put in, because goodness knows I have worked my tail off. But it is really an accident of birth that I was born to my parents who invested in my education at this time, in this world, and made it into this industry. I mean, seriously? Like, how cool is it that we're all here today? Like, how cool is this? Seriously. So I've been grateful the whole way. I was grateful to my parents. I was grateful when I was at Quirky Bernstein. I was grateful at Smith Barney. I was grateful at Merrill Lynch. I was even grateful when I was fired. Look, Dad, I'm on the front page of the paper. <laughs> it's all about perspective. Last lesson, bonus lesson for all of you, which is gratitude is good, but when you're going through adversity, sometimes I find a big glass of wine or three helps a lot too. <laughs> Thank you very much.